Hello everyone and welcome to this video on fibromyalgia and gut health. The objectives today are, are quite simple really. We were going to explore the connection between the gut, the gut microbiome and fibromyalgia. So my name is Alex Manos, I am the co-founder of Health Path and I'm an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner with a background in nutritional therapy. So I have a master's in personalized nutrition and a degree in nutritional therapy. And I am also host of the Health Path podcast. If you are enjoying our content or if you enjoy today's video, we would really appreciate it if you give it a like, share it with anyone who may benefit from listening to it, subscribe to our channel if you would like to be notified when similar content is coming out. I'm going to be releasing weekly videos similar to this on different conditions such as chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, autoimmune disease, etc. So I guess let's start from the basics, which is what is fibromyalgia? Well, a nice explanation is that it is something that is characterized by widespread physical and psychological symptoms that mainly include chronic diffuse pain and fatigue that has to have lasted for more than three months in duration with sleep, mood, and cognitive disturbances. If you wanted the most simple explanation, it's really a functional disorder whereby there is chronic pain. Now, unfortunately, the reason why it's referred to as a functional disorder is because often conventional testing isn't able to detect any abnormalities in your physiology. So you might go to the GP and they might do a basic blood test. Maybe they do a basic stool test. Nothing really seems to come back out of range. And therefore you receive the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion is one way of thinking about it. Other people might refer to it as an umbrella term. It doesn't help us help you. So it's similar to chronic fatigue syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. The frustrating thing is we know based on the research that has been published in medical reviewed journals that there are underlying imbalances that are contributing to this chronic pain to the fatigue, to the sleep mood and cognitive disturbances. And as we've said, today's video is really focusing on the role that the gut can, can play within contributing to fibromyalgia. And I think some of the statistics really show us the significant connection between our gut health and this condition, because 73% of patients with fibromyalgia have altered bowel patterns. They might be experiencing a degree of constipation or a fluctuating between constipation and diarrhea. But interestingly, 32 to 77% of those with irritable bowel syndrome also have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So there is this bi-directional relationship going on here, whereby those with gut issues often have fibromyalgia and vice versa. Now, with fibromyalgia, it does appear that predominantly individuals are suffering with either constipation or mixed type. There aren't as many people struggling with fibromyalgia who have pure um, chronic diarrhea, but obviously that is also very possible. So I just want to emphasize the importance of this. And in this narrative review paper, they essentially argued that the connection between our gut microbiome and chronic pain syndromes like fibromyalgia is so strong that we may even be able to use microbiome analysis as a useful diagnostic test. And all that really is saying is that we can do comprehensive stool testing where we're looking at your gut microbiome or your gut bacteria, but also your fungi and, and potential parasitic infections to help us understand what's driving this chronic pain. Now, whenever I do these videos on YouTube around the role that gut plays in a specific condition, I always wanna be very transparent, which is the gut is not the only thing that contributes to fibromyalgia. There is a wealth of research that discusses various factors that can be involved. And they include different infections, that could be parasitic, viral, or bacterial. We often see nervous system 
dysfunction with imbalances in neurotransmitters such as serotonin, for example. We see microglial activation. Microglia are specific cells found within our central nervous system and neuroinflammation, inflammation of the nervous system. So there are definitely some neurological imbalances that can be associated with fibromyalgia as well. Oxidative stress, which sometimes gets described as kind of the equivalent of rust in your car engine, it's essentially cellular damage that has accumulated to excess levels. We see autoimmune markers in some of the research looking at participants with fibromyalgia. So again, this immune dysregulation is quite a big one within this condition. And then we often see hormonal imbalances. And finally, psychological stresses. There is uh, something called adverse childhood events, often shortened to ACEs. These are kind of childhood traumas, and these have been significantly associated with adulthood disease, not just fibromyalgia, um, but behavioral things like addiction, um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, cancers, metabolic disease, so things like diabetes and obesity. ACEs, adverse childhood events, are things like bullying, um, our parents divorcing in the early years of our life, financial stress within the home, um, physical abuse, whether that's us or whether we're witnessing our parents um, receive physical abuse, emotional neglect. These are all adverse childhood events. And the research is quite clear that if we have four or more of these adverse childhood events, we have a significantly increased risk of adulthood disease 20, 30 years later in life. And part of that is because of the alterations that occur within our stress system, within our neurological system, and within our immune system. So we need to be mindful of these things. And as I say, I wanna be transparent. Today's video is focusing on the gut. There are other things that we might need to consider as well. But when we're focusing on the gut, there are four things that stand out within the research. H. pylori, which is a bacteria that can colonize the stomach. SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Large intestine imbalances, sometimes referred to as LIBO. And leaky gut, where the lining of our digestive tract is excessively leaky and it's allowing things through that shouldn't get through. And when that happens, there is a chronic activation of our immune system, which leads to chronic inflammation. And as we all have become very aware these days, chronic inflammation is a big driver of various systemic conditions. So these are the four things that we can focus on ultimately today. These are the things that we can test for to understand what from a gut perspective might be causing or contributing to your chronic pain. So let's start with SIBO and fibromyalgia. There is a well-known study by Dr. Pimentel. Dr. Pimentel um, is a big name within the world of SIBO. And in their study, they found that it was an incredibly common finding. In fact, every participant in the study who had fibromyalgia was found to have abnormal SIBO tests, i.e. they were found to have small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And we'll touch on the actual mechanism uh, in, later on in today's presentation in regards to, well, how, what's the connection between a bacterial overgrowth in our small intestine and developing chronic pain? And again, I always like to be transparent and we need to be mindful that the research um, has its limitations, shall we say. There is no doubt in my eyes that SIBO has a strong association with fibromyalgia, especially when we think about the mechanisms that connect the two. But there are some limitations within the research that is specifically looked into this, including the limitations of the test itself, the testing procedure, and the diagnostic criteria, meaning with SIBO, for example, we receive a diagnosis of SIBO. Generally, if we have a rise in gas production before the 90 minute mark in a breath test that is normally three hours in length, but some diagnostic criteria use the two hour mark. So half an hour later than what the general consensus is, 
at this point in time. So we need to be mindful that there are some limitations here. So this is an example report of the HealthPath SIBO breath test. Some of you might be familiar with it, but to provide a little summary for those that aren't, it's a three hour test. We are measuring the amount of gas within a breath sample every 20 minutes. And you can see here the two gases, methane is the purple gas, hydrogen is the blue gas. Now with hydrogen, that is how we can diagnose small intestine bacterial overgrowth. A rise of hydrogen of 20 before the 90 minute mark is how we confirm that someone has a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. With methane, methane is produced by what we call archaea. They aren't technically bacteria. They are a more ancient organism. And if we have a result of 10 or higher with methane at any point, within the three hours, that is a positive result for what we refer to as intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Put simply, if we have an overgrowth of either of these organisms, and these organisms are producing these gases, those gases we exhale, and therefore we're measuring the amount of these gases in your breath, and then we have the criteria in place that where we can confirm whether you have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, or methane producing organisms in the small or large intestine. We've got various podcasts that you can check out on our YouTube channel uh, with Dr. Jacoby, with Dr. C. Becker, um, and Dr. Sandberg Lewis, all who discuss SIBO in much more detail if this is something you would like to learn more about. Now, when we think about the gut microbiome, uh, we see generally in the research, a state of dysbiosis, an imbalance within our gut bacteria. This is something that can contribute to chronic pain states as well. But one of the mechanisms is actually related to the molecules that are being produced by our gut bacteria. These molecules can trigger various pathways that contribute eventually to chronic pain. So this is a very sciencey image, but I'm going to keep it very simple for everyone. So don't, don't switch off for a few seconds. We have our gut bacteria within the large intestine. You can see that at the top of this image. We have the gut lining labeled here as the epithelium. We have metabolites. We have things that the bacteria in the large intestine are producing that can travel across or through the gut lining where they communicate with various receptors on the surface of various cells. And when these products, when these metabolites of our bacteria communicate with the receptors on the immune cells, they trigger a mechanism within the immune cell that can often lead to the production of pro-inflammatory molecules or pain signaling molecules. And this is how our gut microbiome can contribute to chronic pain conditions. There is essentially a potential upregulation in various immune pathways in a cellular level, which can drive fibromyalgia. And we know that there's a relationship between inflammation and fibromyalgia or chronic pain conditions. So what about Butyrate metabolizing species. These are bacteria that produce butyrate. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. It is a, a metabolite that these bacteria produce via the fermentation of our dietary fiber. So our plant matter, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, lentils, pulses, beans, etc. So butyrate is a key food for the cells that line the digestive tract. Butyrate helps maintain a healthy gut lining, i.e. it helps prevent the concept of leaky gut. So in our health path gut tests, we look at the amount of the bacteria that are known to produce butyrate. So we can get an understanding of whether an imbalance in butyrate producing bacteria may be involved. We also know through studies that a specific bacteria called Fecalibacterium protznitsi, which is the final bacteria in the image on this slide, 
has anti-pain properties. It also has anti-inflammatory properties. So Fecalibacterium prosnitzi is a really important marker for those struggling with, for example, abdominal pain. And I wonder whether we can extrapolate that to some degree to chronic pain or chronic systemic pain as well. What we can say is that this group of bacteria are ones that we can consider. Then we have leaky gut and fibromyalgia. So altered permeability of the small intestine has been reported in a cohort of patients with fibromyalgia and also complex regional pain syndrome. So the gut lining should be what we refer to as semi-permeable. The gut lining allows certain things through, but should prevent other things from getting through. When we refer to this idea of leaky gut, what we're really referring to is excess chronic leakiness. Things are getting through that shouldn't. That creates a immune response leading to inflammation that can drive chronic pain conditions. And there is a urinary leaky gut test that you can do to confirm whether someone has leaky gut or intestinal permeability for the slightly more technical term. And this is a very simple test where you swallow a little sugary solution and you collect your urine over a period of time. And we're looking to see whether we collect any of these particles that you drank in the solution. So what we have is we have an upper and a lower limit of where these, um, where the urine and the particle should be. And if your sample, if your results ever go over that upper limit, that is essentially indicative of intestinal permeability, AKA leaky gut. The idea being that you drink these, the solution that contains different sized particles. You can see in the graph at the bottom, it says molecular weight fractions. These are just different sized molecules. If you have an intact gut lining, you're just going to eliminate them effectively. When we have intestinal permeability or leaky gut, we're gonna see an increase in the amount of these particles within the urine. And that's what you can see here. So the vast majority of the different molecular weight fractions or molecules came back um, at a higher percentage than what we would expect to see. Hopefully that makes sense for everyone. Now, H. pylori, we mentioned at the very beginning, is a bacteria that can colonize the stomach that has been both associated with a reduction in childhood asthma and allergies, but has also been associated with gastric ulcers, for example. So there's a real context dependent scenario which dictates whether H. pylori is problematic or not, ultimately. And again, the studies are a little bit weak, but the conclusion is that there is weak evidence that H. pylori may play a role in fibromyalgia. And the fact that um, there has been improvement in pain scores after antibiotic treatment of H. pylori is why we feel there is some evidence indicating that there has to be an association between these two things. Those that essentially eradicate H. pylori seem to get improvement in their pain scores. That is not going to be a 100% correlation. So I'm not suggesting that everyone with fibromyalgia who has H. pylori is going to experience benefit by its eradication, but there is certainly a subset of individuals where that is the case. So connecting the two together, well, we've kind of done this in some ways. We've spoken about how metabolites of bacteria communicate with receptors on immune cells that trigger an inflammatory response. But it's not just metabolites of bacteria, it is something called LPS. Now LPS is something that is on the surface of bacteria. And LPS, again, is pro-inflammatory, it's immune triggering, and it can contribute to chronic pain conditions such as fibromyalgia. So if someone were to have leaky gut, and they had an overgrowth of bacteria that contain this LPS particle on its surface or their surface, then that is a situation where someone could go on to develop chronic pain.
Now, this shows us that there is also a relationship really between mitochondria and fibromyalgia. Mitochondria are a subunit of our cells. It is literally the site where we create our energy. And interestingly, the Food and Drug Administration have recently included a black box warning on fibromyalgia-like symptoms when we're using certain antibiotics like fluoroquinolones. Now, mitochondria found in every one of our cell, and we have hundreds or thousands of mitochondria in all of our cells, used to be, billions of years ago, bacteria themselves. As part of evolution, mitochondria merged with bacteria and they developed a partnership. That partnership is actually what has allowed life to form on this planet, ultimately. So when we think that mitochondria billions of years ago used to be bacteria, there is research indicating that antibiotics can disrupt the mitochondria in our cells. Antibiotics kill bacteria, mitochondria were bacteria. So there's this really interesting connection that is discussed in the research there. Not only are, do antibiotics disrupt the gut bacteria and the microbiome, for so for some people, their irritable bowel syndrome started as a course of one or multiple courses of antibiotics, but it may also be impacting the mitochondria in our cells, which can impact fatigue and pain conditions. So there is no doubt in my mind that imbalances in the gut or the microbiome can influence fibromyalgia, and we need to be thinking about H. pylori, SIBO, leaky gut, and the microbiome of the large intestine. But we do not want to ignore all the other factors that we highlighted or summarized that can contribute to fibromyalgia. Anything ranging from childhood trauma and chronic stresses to bacterial, viral, parasitic infections to environmental toxins, such as mold if we lived in a water damaged damp property, for example. But let's move on to some of the general lifestyle interventions that can be considered based on the evidence. Um, and this is something to take with a pinch of salt, guys. These interventions ideally need to be personalized based on what your underlying imbalances are. We've already seen that there are numerous causes to fibromyalgia. So if we take two people and give them the exact same program, it's very likely that it's not going to work for both of them because they're going to have slightly different underlying imbalances causing their current state of health. What we do see is that targeting the gut microbiome is a very likely general intervention that may provide some degree of relief. It represents a novel, potentially fruitful strategy for chronic pain management, according to that article. We also see research that has found improvement in fibromyalgia, a reduction in the severity of the condition on the FODMAP diet or the low FODMAP diet. The low FODMAP diet is reducing our intake of specific foods that contain uh, rapidly fermentable carbohydrates. And those foods include healthy foods like onion, leeks, garlic, asparagus, artichokes, olives, green bananas. These are prebiotic rich foods that in a subset of people with irritable bowel syndrome and fibromyalgia can actually exacerbate symptoms, especially bloating, abdominal pain, and altered bowel movements. So the FODMAP diet, based on the evidence, is something that can be considered, at least in a subset of people with fibromyalgia. And I would propose that anyone who has fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome would potentially benefit from exploring a low FODMAP diet. One of the key things, guys, to remember is the FODMAP diet is a short-term intervention. Do not use it for more than six to eight weeks. It is not designed as a long-term dietary regime. It is there to help restore balance to the gut and really therefore should be done alongside other lifestyle interventions. Stress management, supporting the gut brain access um, and potentially some supplements to support restoration of a healthy gut as well. 
The really interesting thing, though, and you can see this paper, this review paper entitled Nutritional Interventions in the Management of Fibromyalgia Syndrome, has actually shown that lots of different diets have shown to be of benefit. Some studies have even found just the, the benefit of administration of olive oil. Adding more olive oil to the diet is helpful for some. Replacing the diet with ancient grains, coming off your kind of modern day wheats and gluten grain, gluten containing products can be helpful. Other studies have found low calorie diets, gluten free diets, uh, a, a monosodium glutamate and aspartame free diet, vegetarian diets, Mediterranean diets. They have all been found to be effective in different studies. So this is interesting, you know, we've got options to consider, but for me, it also suggests that, you know, diet is only one small piece of the overall, of the overall puzzle, shall we say. So don't get too bogged down in this. We want to make sure it is a nutrient dense, polyphenol rich diet, meaning there's lots of color in there. And you can explore some of this. What happens if you reduce your intake of some of these FODMAP foods? You can quickly Google FODMAP foods and I've listed some of the most common ones obviously just now as well. What happens if you come off gluten for maybe a month? What happens if you move towards more of a vegetarian diet? We can do a little bit of experimentation over maybe a month or so doing one thing at a time to understand how you are responding to these different dietary habits. So with the gut in mind, the tools in our toolkit really are probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, which are a combination of the two, and fecal microbiota transplants, which is becoming a more evidence-based um, therapy, shall we say. Now, the evidence on probiotics in isolation is somewhat limited, and that's understandable. We can't expect that much improvement just by the supplementation of one probiotic. However, as part of an overall program, obviously we might see significant changes to symptoms. Other interventions that have been explored in the research are vitamin D, magnesium, and iron. So we wanna ensure someone is an iron deficient anemic. We want to make sure they're not vitamin D deficient. We want to make sure they're not magnesium deficient. Magnesium and vitamin D are surely two of the most common deficiencies um, that I see clinically. And iron is a, a very common deficiency from a global perspective, not so much in the modern world. But if you're vegan, pescatarian, vegetarian, it is certainly something that you would want to rule in or rule out um, ultimately, because it is a very common cause of fatigue based symptoms, but to some degree fibromyalgia as well. And then other evidence-based interventions are the supplement CoQ10, supplementing melatonin. Mindfulness practices have been found to improve fibromyalgia. There's a brilliant book called Mindfulness for Health. Uh, they recommend only reading one chapter of the book per week, and each chapter comes with a downloadable 10-minute meditation around mindfulness. It's a really brilliant resource for all of us who are looking to uh, have a consistent mindfulness practice. Massage, chiropractics, aquatic physiotherapy, breath work has been shown to improve fibromyalgia. And that was a 30 minute session, seven times a week, so daily for 12 weeks. You could consider looking at the app Flourish, which is being created by Richie Bostock, AKA the breath guy. And that app offers 30 to 55 minutes long breathwork sessions that are both going to be of benefit, but can be very healing on an emotional, spiritual level as well. I had lots of experience with his app and uh, used it a lot during the lockdowns in 2020, 2021. Um, psychedelics have been theorized to be of benefit, obviously illegal in the UK at the moment, but for those of you listening to this in places like the Netherlands, Portugal, and maybe in certain US states, that is something that can be uh, explored, shall we say. And then hypnotherapy also has evidence behind it. We've got a lot of tools in our toolkit, guys. There are others here as well. Um, things like resonance therapy is something that has also been discussed in the research to be, benef benef or to be of benefit, sorry, in chronic pain conditions. 
So to learn more about us, you can visit our website, healthpath.com. You can book free 15 minute consultations with our customer services team if you would like to learn more about the testing that we offer and the support that we can provide. And as always, guys, if you have enjoyed today's video, um, click the like button, share it with friends, family, colleagues, leave us a comment and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any future videos similar to this one. But for now, thank you for listening. Uh, and I, as I say, I'll be releasing more of these videos on a weekly best basis coming up.